Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. We continue this morning in the uh, second chapter of the book of Acts. Last week we saw the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, which many see as the birthday of the church. God then performed two different miracles in and through the disciples. First, the disciples were speaking in real human languages they didn't know, which I think would be kind of cool. I'd like to do that. I'd like to be able to speak the language that I do know. Secondly, people from at least 16 different places with different languages and dialects heard the disciples preaching in their own languages. So you have a, you have a translation going on of somebody speaking a language they don't know which I think is just really cool. The t disciples were preaching what the Holy Spirit was giving them to preach, which brings us to our text this morning that's all about Sermon 1. You know, we talk about Pentecost being the beginning of the church. And if a major portion of the way the church operates is the preaching, Peter has the opportunity to preach Sermon 1 in the church age. Not a, not a title that a lot of people, or a distinction that a lot of people got to have. A lot of them probably could have. John probably could have preached a pretty good sermon. I would guess that all of the disciples could have. But Peter is the one that the Holy Spirit tapped to preach Sermon 1. Now you notice that Chuck only read from a few verses. We're going to cover 14 through 36. So we might go all the way until the Christmas party. I don't know. Let's get started. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour. Last week we concluded with people in Jerusalem being curious about what the disciples were doing, what was going on. Remember the scene. There had been the sound of a great violent wind, a tornado, hurricane, something like that. The sound of it, not the wind of it, just the sound of it. Jerusalem is two, three, four times its population there because everybody was coming from around the Mediterranean for the, uh, for the feast days. And they hear this wind and they came out of the, their apartments and out of their, their rooms and came to the streets and were going, what's going on? We heard the tornado, but we don't see the damage. And they began talking among themselves. and then the disciples began to speak in languages they didn't know. And the people from 16 different places with different dialects and languages were hearing them preach in their own tongue. And some of them wondered, remember we saw last week, some were amazed. But others, in typical fashion of not accepting something, something turned to ad hominem attacks. Well, they're not really speaking in other languages, they're just drunk. I can tell you for certainty that people, when they're drunk, they speak funny, but they don't speak languages they don't know. They say all sorts of things, but never languages that they don't know, and they don't preach about God. So Peter gets up, to the, gets up and calls everybody's attention. Hey, listen, listen to me. And he gets everybody to, to listen to what he's saying. And he says, they're not drunk. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour. He raises his voice to speak over the noise of what's going on in the crowd of people. And he says, listen to me. 
all you people of Jerusalem and other lands. Peter knows who's he, who he is talking to. He knows he's talking to people from all over the place. And I suspect he's still talking in a foreign language, and they're hearing him in multiple foreign languages. Peter tells the crowd, listen, they're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Kind of a humorous statement, actually. Kind of adding a little levity to the, to the tension of what's going on. Because, remember, you have two groups. You have those that are listening in amazement and those that are saying they're drunk. And so there was naturally some conflict between them. We've seen that over and over in the last couple of months, haven't we? And so Peter injects a little levity. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. They haven't got time to get drunk yet. It's kind of what he's saying. But then he moves on. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and on my female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to, be, and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter begins quoting from the Septuagint version or the Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. The Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was not a great translation, but it was, a, it was what the typical Jew in Israel at the time of Jesus would use to talk about the Old Testament. And Peter believes that Joel's prophecy is at least being partially fulfilled in the coming of the Holy Spirit. Remember earlier that day, the Holy Spirit came. That sound of the violent wind. And Peter appears to believe that the coming of the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of the prophecy he just quoted. The disciples gathered in Jerusalem included young men and old men, and young women and old women. The gathered disciples had just received the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, as we saw last week. And they began to speak all about the wonders of God. You should recall from our series in the Gospel of Matthew that when, Matthew, that when Jesus died on the cross, it got dark out. It got really dark out. And there was an earthquake and there were other signs. These wonders of heaven, Peter believes, are a partial fulfillment of the prophecies of Joel. Now, look here real close at, at verse 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. To quote directly from Joel 2.32. Joel predicted a day when all those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't think Joel understood what he predicted. I don't, I don't think he understood that there would be a church age. I think he always believed, as all the Old Testament writers did, that God would continue to deal with the world through Israel. But Israel didn't do what God wanted. Repeatedly they didn't. And as we know, in 722 B.C., the Assyrians took the ten tribes, ten northern tribes captive. Then in 605 to 586, Babylon took the southern tribes captive. Israel was never free again. They were given permission 70 years later to go back to Israel and rebuild the temple, but they were always under the control of others. Except for a short period of time under the Maccabees. Hanukkah just began, and that celebrates the freedom given to them and the cleansing of the temple in Hanukkah or uh, from, uh, during the period of the Maccabees. But they never were really free. After Babylon and Medo-Persia came, 
came Greece. After Greece came Rome. And after Rome, they were no more. Joel didn't understand all that. He didn't know all of that picture. Peter's beginning to get the idea. Peter's beginning to see that Israel has been set on the side and God was now going to deal with the world through the people that are followers of Jesus. Of course, today we call them Christians. We call it the church. I should point out that the immediate context of the passage in Joel is the end times. Not the church age, but the end times. When Jesus restores Israel and sets up the messianic kingdom. Joel is a prophecy of the end of that period. When Israel is restored. But Peter is now applying some of what Joel said to what happens in the church age. The principle is good throughout the church age. Salvation comes to those who call on the name of the Lord. I'd be remiss not to add that those who call on the name of the Lord are moved to do so by the Holy Spirit. And those people that are moved by the Holy Spirit are the ones that had been elected by God before the foundation of the world. Salvation is a work of God and not of us. While there is the act of calling on the name of the Lord, the, the volition to do that, the will to do that and the power to do that comes from God. In quoting a passage from Joel, Peter sets up his coming statements concerning Jesus the Messiah and the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. So here's our first interactive question. Remember, that means I ask a question and you answer the question. Why did Peter quote the Old Testament to these Jews gathered in Jerusalem? They only had the Old Testament, okay. And? A validation of what he was saying, okay. About to say, yeah. Others? Talking about the same God? Peter was about to establish for these Jews that Jesus was, the Jesus that they crucified that they rejected is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Remember, the Jews were all in town in Jerusalem for the feasts, to do the sacrifice in the temple and to, to celebrate the almost two months long worth of, of feasts in, in Israel. They were all good Jews. They were all doing what God said to do in the fulfillment of the law. And Peter is applying everything they knew in the law to Jesus. The guy he, they rejected. The one that Israel corporately, nationally said, crucify him. Instead of Hosanna, which they said five days earlier. Peter goes on and says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you, to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the de definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Peter says, listen to me. This Jesus, who you crucified, is the fulfillment of what God said in the Old Testament. Remember, the people Peter was speaking to were Jews who had come to Jerusalem for the feasts. They were the same ones that had seen Jesus on the day of uh, the triumphal entry and said, Hosanna, and then five days later said, Crucify Him. Executed by the Romans at the request of the Jews. Now Peter was introducing Jesus to them as the Messiah, 
the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Peter is preaching what many commentators refer to as the first church sermon. He tells these Jews that Jesus' ministry was authenticated through mighty works, signs, and wonders. Mighty works is the Greek word dynamese, from which we get dynamite. Mighty works focuses on the great power displayed by Jesus. Signs is the Greek word semeosis, which speaks of signs or signals or indicators or flags. It means something that points to something or someone else. Wonders is the Greek word teraesai, which means an object of wonder or marvel. So Peter's telling the Jews that Jesus' ministry was attested to by things that can't be explained in any other way than God does them. There are very powerful things that no one but God can do. Not just great events, but things that supersede the so-called laws of nature. In other words, by God alone. God alone validated the ministry of Jesus. Of course, this was contrary to what the Jews had been taught or understood. So here's your second question this morning. Why was it important for Peter to emphasize that God validated, that God validated the ministry of Jesus? See, you're already forgotten. I asked the question, you answered. Why was it important for Peter to emphasize that God validated, not somebody else, but God validated the ministry of Jesus? Yep, they believed in God, not necessarily in Jesus. Anybody else? That's right. Israel had rejected Jesus. Their hearts had been hardened. And they they couldn't see the reality of Jesus the Messiah. They couldn't if they had wanted to. Because God hardened their hearts. They couldn't recognize Jesus the Messiah right in front of them. But now the dispensation had changed from the age of law to the church age. From focus on the world through Israel to focus on the world through the church. God's dealing with the world had been changed to the church from Israel. The people gathered in Jerusalem for the feast that heard the violent winds of sound had the opportunity now to follow Jesus. Despite what official Israel had said, They had the opportunity to come to know the real Jesus, the Messiah, authenticated by God himself. Look closely at verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. I I love this kind of verse. The same Jesus was attested to by God was delivered up by God according to His plan, to God's plan. While at the same time, the Jews crucified and killed Him. Look at the antinomy that goes on in this verse. Look at the juxtaposition here. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified. You did something by God's plan. Now that's not what they wanted to hear. How could it be God's plan? And we did it. We know that God planned for Jesus to die on the cross before he created the universe. Before the first sin made it necessary. We also know that from the Sanhedrin's vantage point, they were the ones that sent Jesus to the cross. Because Jesus threatened their livelihood. Now the official reason is because they believed he blasphemed, but the real reason is because They threatened their livelihood. He threatened their livelihood. Because they were getting wealthy by 
taking from the people of Israel as they led. Kind of sounds like politicians that we know. They are the ones that sent Jesus to the cross without understanding that they were fulfilling the plan that God had ordained before he created the world. Both are true. They sent him to the cross. God planned it. It seems like they can't have both being true, but both are true. It's all a matter of a vantage point. But God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Jesus went to the cross where he died. His dead body was placed in a borrowed grave where it lay until Sunday morning. God resurrected Jesus and he came out of the grave as we saw in our messages from Matthew. Jesus' resurrection is critical to our eternal life. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and our faith is in vain. If Jesus is still dead in a grave somewhere, you got nothing. You have absolutely nothing to hang your hat on. The Apostle Paul also said that we're to be most of all pitied. Jesus' death is necessary for our salvation. Jesus' resurrection is necessary for our eternal life. Jesus' resurrection is what makes eternity possible for us. For David, Peter continues on, For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, so let your Holy One, uh, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter quotes from Psalm 16. Psalm 16 had always been understood by the Jews to apply to David. And David alone. But now, Peter tells the Jews, no, no, it applies to Jesus as well. Through the direction of the Holy Spirit, Peter applies Psalm 16 to Jesus, making Psalm 16 a messianic prophecy. Peter didn't use the psalm to validate the resurrection, but to validate that Jesus is the Messiah, the true Messiah, the one that Israel had been waiting for. We need to conclude that Peter properly saw Jesus as the link between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures. Peter also says that Jesus' resurrection provides us gladness in our current life and situation. And he continues on, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Peter was saying, just we can go look at David's tomb. He's still dead. He didn't come out of the tomb. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would sit or that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of, of the Christ, of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. We need to remember that Peter's preaching to, to Jews in Jerusalem that were there for the feasts. These men knew the Old Testament. Many of them had the Old Testament memorized, which is quite remarkable as far as I'm concerned. I had a professor in seminary that had the entire Bible memorized. He taught Old Testament, and we could we could go to any we could just throw up a verse, and he would ha, he would be able to say it. He didn't bring a Bible or notes to class. You know, as a young kid, I was really intimidated by that. He had the entire Bible memorized. That's kind of remarkable. Many of the people that Jesus, that Peter was talking to also had the Old Testament memorized. 
That was part of their deal. Part of their claim to being seen by God. I have all of your word memorized. Not that they had a relationship with him, just that, look how good I am. I've memorized all that you have. As Peter develops Jesus the Messiah for these men, they were beginning to see something in the Old Testament they'd not previously seen. David, who they viewed as the greatest king in Israel, predicted that someday a man would come from his descendants to be the Messiah. Peter was telling them that that man was the God Jesus. Peter establishes that Psalm 16 is not about David. David's still dead and still in his grave. Psalm 16 is all about someone who didn't remain in the grave. Someone who came out of the grave. And that can only be Jesus. David was promised that someone would eventually occupy David's throne. Jesus is that someone. Peter then reminds the Jews listening that Jesus was raised from the dead. Fifty days earlier, Jesus came out of the grave. Many of them were in town for that. They were there for the two months of Passover to Pentecost. The almost two months. You can just imagine how the word of Jesus' resurrection spread throughout Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin paid the soldiers to say, yeah, the disciples came and stole his body while we were sleeping. A capital crime. And word spread. Well, who stole it? What happened? Where'd he go? And then there was talk about, well, so-and-so saw him. Did, did you hear that? So-and-so saw him. And, and, so, and, and other saw him. And as we learn later, more than 500 at one time saw him. So you can imagine how the conspiracy theories, how all of these conversations were going on as there was amazement and denial. All around the city, there had to be this discussion. But they all witnessed that something had happened. Peter says, we're all witnesses to that, that he was raised. Because something happened. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know and for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter was presenting the complete gospel to the people. He couldn't end with the death of Jesus on the cross, nor could he end with the resurrection of Jesus. He had to follow up with Jesus' ascent back to the throne of God. Peter quotes from Psalm 110, Tying Jesus with God and sitting on God's throne in heaven. Peter includes in his quote of Psalm 110 that ultimately the Father will make all Jesus' enemies subservient to him, his footstool. Peter drives it home by calling all of Israel to be recognized or to recognize that Jesus, the humble carpenter from Nazareth, is both Lord and Christ, or Lord and Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew Mashiach. The Messiah is also the Master, the Sovereign. In short, Peter is declaring that the Messiah that was less than two months earlier on a Roman cross in Jerusalem is also the Sovereign God. Look closely at the end of verse 36. Look closely at the end of verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Here's your final question this morning. Why did Peter end this section of his sermon with a dig at the Jews? This Jesus whom you crucified.
He was a rough guy. Give it as good as he got. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? I think Peter did it to reflect on the fact that the Jews thought Jesus was dead. You guys killed him. I mean, it's on you that he's dead, right? But he's not dead, Peter reminded them. The fact that he's not dead means a big deal. The fact that you saw him go to the cross, you saw him die, and then get placed in a grave, but he's not in the grave. We could go back to what he said before, and we all know that. The whole town's talking about the fact that the grave is empty. If the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin had his body, they would have presented it. They would have stopped this thing right then. But they didn't. His body was gone. And we have lots of people claiming to have seen him. Not lying on a slab dead, but alive. And the whole town is talking about it. Everybody knew what was going on. But you guys killed him. But he's not dead. That was the introduction to Peter's first sermon. He's just getting started. He's got lots more to go. Next week, Lord willing, or probably after Christmas, we will see Peter continue in his presentation to the Jews in Jerusalem. So let's deal with, with what we've just seen. Peter presented to the religiously minded Jews, people that were thinking about God, that's why they came to Jerusalem. They had gathered there for the feast. Peter presented to them who the Messiah really was. Not what these Jews thought they were going to find when they went to look for the damage of the violent wind. They came out of the buildings to find damage from wind and they saw Peter preaching to them about the risen Messiah. Peter was preaching to them about the wonders of God. Peter presented the resurrected Jesus as both both Lord and Messiah, as the sovereign God and the Redeemer of Israel. The guy they had been waiting for and didn't see. Peter has begun to introduce to those Jews the truth of Jesus raised from the dead and now sitting at God's right hand in heaven. They needed to know the truth of who Jesus is and what he had already done. That's to be our message as well. People today still need to know who Jesus is. Jesus is not the guy on the front of a Christmas card. Peter's not the silhouette behind Santa Claus. Jesus is the sovereign Lord who maintains the universe. It was recently pointed out to me, I say that all the time, that he's the creator, sustainer. But he continued to maintain the integrity of the universe in his power while he became part of the universe and grew in Mary's belly. He maintained the integrity of the wooden cross as he hung on it and died to save us from our sins. We have the mission from Jesus to make disciples of all people, baptizing them and teaching them all that Jesus taught. That mission is still intact. That mission is still what we're to do. Christmas is the perfect opportunity to do it. Because much of the world, at least in some little bit of way, is thinking about Jesus. Just like Jews throughout that region were thinking about a Messiah when they went to Jerusalem for the Passover. In just a little way, 
They were thinking about God's redemption plan. So as the opportunity presents this time of year, and they talk about Christmas, talk to your friends and neighbors about the reason for the season. That's not just a saying. It should be the reality of the season. Christmas is all about Jesus coming as a baby so that he could die on a cross, so that he could be raised from the dead to give you salvation and eternal life. Without Christmas, that doesn't work. Without Easter, that doesn't work. All of those have to be true. So, talk about that with your friends and neighbors just a little bit as they consider what Christmas means. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that you give us, for the truth of of your word. Thank you that Peter, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit recognized the reality of those passages being messianic passages and talking about a risen Savior, a risen Messiah. Thank you that Peter introduced those people seeking a Messiah to the real Messiah. Let that be a model for us at Christmas time to talk about Jesus, not just the baby in the manger but the man on the cross, the man who came out of the grave. Thank you, Father, for blessing us. We love you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116. Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.